Um, hello, we made it to the last panel of the day. How are you guys feeling? Good? I'm a little tired, but I wore my special shoes with bootstraps so I can pull them myself up by them in case I get tired. Um, <laughs> so yeah, I have the honor of introducing our panel for Expanding the Table, Intergenerational Activism and Policy Change. So first of all, a thank you to the panel right before us for setting the historical context for this conversation we're about to have, kind of discussing how to center youth voices and also navigate activism intergenerationally, what the best practices are, what the strengths are, but also what our personal experiences are in doing so. Um, so I'm gonna let the panelists introduce themselves, but just for names, we have Tatiana Benjamin, who is an American Studies PhD candidate at the University of Maryland College Park, um, who just, I heard, defended her uh, dissertation over here, Tatiana. Um, and closest to me, I should have gone closest to me farthest, but uh, we have Asia Gardner, uh, a, who is a poet and activist for Split This Rock. And then at the end, we have Sumi Yi, who is a community organizer for the National Korean American Service and Education Consortium. So that's a lot. And before uh, organizing this or having helped organize this with uh, Melody Frierson and Becky Chow. Um, I wasn't really familiar with these organizations, so if you could start by talking about your organization, your work, how you got into it, and sort of what your journey has been, that'd be great. So usually in these times we do rock, paper, scissors, and knock a sec, but you know, since I have the mic now, I just, okay. <laughs> Hi, like she said, my name is Sumi. That long organizational name, we actually just call it Nakasek. Um, and, you know, what we primarily do is work with Asian American communities. And so we try to organize uh, the Asian, the AAPI, Asian American uh, Pacific Islander folks to really get um, active and engaged in terms of social and racial and economic justice. And so we're a national org, but we I'm actually out from the Virginia office. And so we'll be doing a lot of that. Um, in terms of how I got involved, um, it's actually a funny story. So before I got here, I actually never heard of Nakasek. Um, before this, I was actually working for a state delegate. And I just told my delegate, I was like, you know, I really got to find my roots. I got to see some Asian people like I am out here. And I don't see my Asian folks. And so I really want to know what my Asian community needs. And I want to, I just want to hear them out. I'm just curious. And so I moved back. I was out in Roanoke, which is the southwest part of Virginia. And I came back to uh, northern Virginia and then found this, this organization. And... Um, so my friend, my best friend, her name's Sandy, and we went through high school and college together and also elementary school, so we were like blood sisters by, at this point. And um, you know, she really talked to me about what it means to be undocumented. So um, she was the first person, and um, she's the one really that, that really fuels my passion for doing this work. Um, we were in high school and, uh, you know, we were talking about our FAFSA and talking about college, going to public colleges and talking about getting our driver's license, getting a car. And you know, there was Sandy who couldn't be a part of that conversation. And to feel uncomfortable and feel like you have to hide and run away from conversations that are just, that are things that we all want to talk about and be engaged in, um, I saw that that was a pain that I, I never felt. And um, working with Nakasek, I saw so many youth who had to struggle with the same things and even more, you know, already, even folks with status struggle, you know, with getting out of college and all of the debt, you know, paying off things um, and really knowing what to do with our education. But that is amplified. Those struggles are amplified for those that are undocumented. So um, that's just a little bit why I'm doing the work, why I'm still here even with all the, you know, farmer's tan and all that. But yeah, so I think that's, that's my story. Um, hi, I'm Aisha Gardner. Um, I am with Split This Rock, a nonprofit organization around um, poetic provocation and witness. Um, I have been with Split This Rock since 
2012, when I was a sophomore in high school. I was a sophomore. Yeah, I must have been a sophomore. Um, <laughs> and um, I started out, okay, a little bit about me and my life. I was a natural, like, poet, artist, you know, raised up in, um, in an artistic household. My mom was a visual artist uh, who is a librarian actively now. Um, and my sister's father, who was my male influence in the house, was a drummer. And he drummed with the likings of Jonathan Butler and um, currently is with, um, who is he with right now? Valerie Simpson. Um, so I grew up in this really like earthy arts environment, right? Um, I went to high school at Woodrow Wilson High School, uh, which is in Tinleytown, right? So that's in a predominantly white area of DC. Um, and for me, I noticed in high school, right, there was no place for me in my music department. There was no place for me in my theater department, right? So if I was to decide to go out and try out for the school play, and I wanted the main role because I'm, I can sing jazz, you know? I can act. They've trained me my whole life for this. I've been exposed to artists and people, right? I can do that. I can claim that role. I would get responses from the people who are in charge, the directors of the plays and you know, the sponsors of the program to say like, you are amazing, so we wanna give you an ensemble role because we can know that you can support the cast so well, right? And you look at the ensemble year after year after year and it's full of colored kids, you know? And this is just where they get their space in school. And that was not enough for me. Um, so I went to my librarian with a group of my friends who were also my tried and true ensemble friends and we saw my mother happened to be the librarian of the school. We were so upset. We were like, Mom, they're, they're keep doing this to us, and, and we're, we're better than them. I know we can do better. And she was like, I dare you to start a club. Start some kind of club. Do something. Um, and at that time, um, Split This Rock was just opening the Louder Than a Bomb competition for high schools. Um, Louder Than a Bomb is a competition that started out in Chicago um, to bring their area high schools together to get all the students on stage for poetic exchange, right? So bring your personal stories, your, your thoughts on politics, your uh, view into your world, you know, and let's exchange it from all corners. And they brought that to the DMV. We're like, we want in. We want to be a part of it. We don't know what it is or what it entails, but we want in. Um, and that year, we co-founded Motley Society, which is the current standing um, poetry club and team at Woodrow Wilson Senior High School. Uh, for my friends, we named ourselves Motley Society because we were a group of people, we said um, we could not fit in. We just couldn't for the likings of us, you know? We were art kids, I was a poet. Um, we represented a full diversity. You know, it wasn't just black, it was, Afri it was um, Afro-Latino, it was Latino, it was um, Caucasian, it was everybody, you know, all we were together in this because we shared a completely different idea external to what stood, you know? And Split This Rock came and gave us coaches. They gave us two, two cool dudes to come and just summon as many kids to get our message to more kids who might be feeling our way in our school, right? And we look up one day, and we have a whole team. And we're all writing poetry together. And we're like, poetry is nothing but songs without music, but rap without a beat, but uh, you know, a monologue without like, the, all the cast and costumes and all that kind of stuff. So we can live here, you know? Um, currently, I've gone on to uh, you split this rock and the things that they've taught me on poetic activism um, to go back to that school that I graduated from. And I'm currently a facilitator of their, uh, excuse me, of their poetry club as it stands now through Split This Rock. Um, we are participating in that same competition. We went on to win the first two years of it that year. We went on to, you know, keep in, in all the festivities, you know, that there are students around all the high schools that felt like we felt at our school. You know, it didn't matter about the demographic. It didn't matter where it was. It felt like there just was no, there was a confined space that an, a minority artist could exist in, you know? So we broke that. We completely changed it up, you know? So now I sit on a board with youth, youth facilitators of all walks of life, you know? And we come together and we work with students to get them into a place of feeling like they belong they have a place for themselves. Like your talent is not gonna go to waste here. It's not gonna slip away from you. You're not gonna age out of it. This is your time and you can do it. Um, so that's, that's a little bit about me. <laughs> Great. Um, 
as stated, I'm Tatiana, and I'm happy to share the space with both of these wonderful people and all of these people. <laughs> um, a little bit about me and my story. Um, I am a graduate student at the University of Maryland College Park. I'm not officially um, affiliated with any organization, but when you start graduate school, you have to find your research project. And I was reading a book one day, and one of the scholars stated that a respondent said to them, study yourself, study people like yourself. Right? Oftentimes, you find research around blackness um, being done by scholars who are not from these communities or communities of color. So I wanted to tell that story. <laughs> um, and I grew up in New York, and I grew up in a family, a mixed status family. My family's Jamaican, but I had folks who were documented and undocumented. And I was like, well, why isn't this story being told? <laughs> the often the immigration, race, and ethnicity narrative is about black immigrants advancing, that they're doing better than their African American counterparts. There's this kind of model minority myth <laughs> around the success of black immigrants. But where about, what about the narratives of black immigrants who are working class? Um, folks who are undocumented, who have been deported. Within my own family, I've had two people deported. When I was about eight years old, my eldest brother was deported back to Jamaica. Then, when I was graduating high school, I had an uncle deported back to Jamaica. Um, and I was like, well, what's happening here? <laughs> Why is this narrative not being told? Uh, we now have a movement around dreamers, but often the representation and that image is of non-black Latinx folks. <laughs> so where are the dreamers who are black? <laughs> Why is their story not being told? Why are they not being represented? How come they don't have access to DACA? What is that narrative? So my dissertation itself is about how are immigrant advocacy organizations addressing the needs of a growing, historically disadvantaged black immigrant population? How are orgs like the National Immigration Law Center or other orgs that seek to serve all immigrants, all low-income immigrants, doing, doing intersectional work? And is that work being done well? And how can it be improved? So I have worked with orgs like NILK. I've also worked with the Undocu Black Network as some of the orgs that I've been able to work with and Nakasak as well <laughs> during the AAPI um, Immigrant Action Day. So the goal has been to really understand black lens more broadly and that's been the goal of my work. Wonderful. Well, thank you all so much. So a common thread I'm seeing, and, and this is applicable to me too as a former foster youth who's doing research on foster youth and does activism in, in that community, we're all connected to our activist communities through personal experience. And so my big question here is, we cannot make change or we cannot grow a movement just by the people who are most affected by those issues. So how do we incorporate more young people with diverse experiences and different backgrounds and motivate and engage them in activist work that may not be directly relevant to them, or even if it is, may not be accessible to them? How do we center young voices? Well, I can speak on that. Um, I feel like my young voice was centered at one point in my life. <laughs> um, how can you, you just reach out, you know? Uh, when you see a student um, in, in my programs, you know, it wouldn't, I imagine in other programs around, there, there are, this wide access you know, to a large diversity, a large demographic of students from all areas and all, all walks of life. In that process, whatever program you know, your, I don't know, whatever curriculum your program entails, um, you notice the moment they are stepping into themselves and you see the fear in them. You know, you see the unsure, you, you're watching them like struggle under the judgment. Um, you push them into greatness. You challenge them to challenge themselves. You challenge yourself. You challenge your curriculum. You challenge your program um, because it's all subject to change, you know? And that's the only way we can make a change is to change how we, we currently exist. Um, I can speak on an uh, instance with Split This Rock. My, my, <laughs> my poetry club recently, um, I allowed them to be involved in a conversation instead of practice for the day. Um, where their school was having a diversity task force um, around a play that they wanted to do. Um, it was a beautiful, the play was Colored Museum. And I don't know who, many people are familiar with Colored Museum, um, but it is an African-American satire on the black experience in America, right? Um, it was being produced 
by a, a group external to the school of predominantly white kids. They had casted black kids for the roles. These kids had never had an opportunity to participate in theater, you know, so they're like, I got a role for me, I can do this, everything. And I saw a need for communication. They had to, my poets who spend their time studying African American experience, they stay in the library reading up on their history and their lineage to students who didn't necessarily have that first inclination, you know? So me as a facilitator, I say, go join the conversation. You know, let's start there. Inevitably, you get around, the, the kids decided they would not go on with the production, that it was something that they had not thought on completely. You know, but I looked up now, and my, my poetry club goes from being four, goes to being nine. You know, and these kids are seeing me as someone who wants to be a part of the conversation. So when the kids are getting like, riled up and they're in their tears because their lives are real, you know, they sit in classes and they feel under the, the pressure of society, of, of stereotypes, of constructs of just being life and their circumstances, the cards they were dealt. Those are real moments. You know, we have to acknowledge them. And they have to realize that they're real and not subject. They aren't just something they put together in their mind. You know? um, so I, I give them their validity in that moment. I tell them, you are entitled to go through whatever process, but we have to come out of this with a resolution. You know? So before we leave and we wipe these tears, we've got to walk out knowing what we're doing tomorrow when we come back. You know? And I feel like it may be stressful for me as a, as a facilitator, but I know it gave some kind of change to the temperature. So getting kids involved is as simple as acknowledging them you know, and being aware of the processes when they're put in front of you. Um, Sumi, Tatiana, have you seen any strategies work? Yes. I would add to that. Youth are passionate. They want to get involved. They see things happening. They're trying to figure out, how can I get involved? What can I do? My advice is pick an issue. You can't solve everything at the same time. Pick one issue. Go learn about it. Maybe today you go read a book about it. Um, you go find somebody on your campus or at your school or your organization. Because youth are also watching you. <laughs> right? They're always watching. They're always looking. Um, then the next step is if you have questions, let's dialogue. I'll answer your questions. I'll talk with you. If I don't know the answer, I'll find the resource with you. Teach them how to do the research. <laughs> go out to that one movement, to that protest, to that event. <laughs> Go learn more about it. For me, I think education is so important. Are we teaching youth how to find out more about the institution and the structures that are causing the issues? Regardless if they're issues that are a part of your own identity or not. <laughs> Do you know the root cause? Anti-capitalism. Let's talk about anti-blackness. <laughs> right? Those that have the same roots. <laughs> right? How do we talk about power? Um, so I don't know if everyone here knows what organizing is, because I sure didn't when I first applied. I was like, what is organizing? And, and really, um, it's about, I heard this term, it's a grassroots consultant. And so you're really um, going to your communities and listening to what it is that's the problem, that's the issue, that, that concerns our people and our neighbors and our families. And um, your question on how we can get people who are not directly impacted to get involved in this activism work is, I myself am not directly impacted by uh, you know, the things that we've been working on, which is DREAM Act, um, DACA, um, and a lot of our undocumented people who go through struggles every day. And um, you know, we, I see high schoolers, I, I also do a youth program, and they are not impacted, directly impacted. And, I think that there is a need for change in how we phrase you know, those who are allies because we say we have impacted, directly impacted, and then indirectly impacted. But at the end of the day, every single one of us that are involved in this, in this movement in, in this society, we are all impacted in one way or another. And to, I think that's the one thing that people you know, tend to forget. It's like, oh no, you know, um, we have to put those that are directly impacted at the forefront. They are also important, but we have to recognize the need for allyship. And I think once we recognize what kind of power those who can support and really 
be, uh, you know, be the voice that sometimes, you know, through voting and civic engagement that undocumented folks or other folks um, that are oppressed can't have, that's, that's an important role. And so I think educating, like you said, educating our young people, but I think also showing them that there is, it's all connected. That you know the issue that we face personally, the issues that your parents face, and the issue that an undocumented family faces, issue that Black people face, the, these these issues are all connected. And that's one thing that folks forget. Like, oh, we got to think about immigrant immigrant communities, you know. And then within those communities, it's like, all right, we have the Black community, and then we have you know the Asian community, and and we start separating. And I think there, once we see that there is a connection amongst all of us that we are all oppressed and that's why we're in this movement now, is when we can have that involvement of everyone that's that like uh, everyone terms as um, directly, uh, indirectly impacted. But I think there's a need to say we're all impacted and that's why, that's why we have to be here. That's why we have to fight this movement, fight this battle. We have to do it together or it's just not gonna happen. Mm. Wonderful. Uh, Sumi, I wanna build off of something that you said about measuring impact. So that word gets thrown around everywhere in the activist space, measure impact, you know, count how many people showed up. Um, but what, beyond quantitative measures, how do you measure the, the impact of a movement, um, specifically with youth activists, where um, a lot of times they're disenfranchised, right? If they're under 18, they can't vote. If they're undocumented, they can't vote. Um, how far can youth activism actually go and how can we measure that distance? And anyone can answer, not just. <laughs> well, I actually want to touch on that because it's so funny. So sometimes when I'm in the shower or I'm doing my makeup, I like listening to podcasts. I'm like, I'm going to do something productive. So that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to be learning while I'm showering. Like, this is going to be a productive, productive day. I'm like, you know, I got the panel. Let's start it with a podcast. And I don't know if you all know Simon Sinek. Do you guys, he's like this really big guy in leadership. And he was talking about um, leadership in a very, in a really simple way. And so I always say that the first thing that's always on my um, like New Year's resolution is I'm gonna go to the gym every day. I know all of you share that resolution and I failed to do it all for like 23 years, but you know, I, there's never that consistency, but you know, we have that urge to wanna get involved, uh, to wanna go to the gym. The first few weeks we're going and we're going every day. And then you know, at some point we'll fall through and that fall through may take a long time and then next thing you know, you're just never going. And so what he said was, you know, just like leadership and also that impact is the same way. Going, um, you know, going to the gym once, you're not gonna look any different in the mirror. Going to the gym twice, uh, it's still not gonna be any different. But if you go every single day and have that consistency, you will see a difference at some point. And then you'll realize, oh, something's happening. That's the same thing with a movement, that's the same thing with an impact. You participate in one protest, you're not gonna see a difference. You go to one you know, a legislative meeting, that's still not gonna make a difference. But if you consistently move, trying to make an impact day by day, and you just fix some of these habits that maybe is, is feeding onto this oppressive system, those little changes will one day, you will see that there is a change, that there is, we are making a difference and there is an impact. So when we think about, of course we can look at, and once we get to a point where um, we're making that impact, I feel like it's easier to measure. You'll see more people come you'll see legislation and policy going towards the change that you need. And so it's just about, I feel like it's so important to always consistently be involved in that fight and that movement. I wanna touch on that, what Sumi said about presence. I completely agree with presence. Um, as I've told you guys before, I was a youth of Split This Rock who is now a teaching artist at Split This Rock. I've been involved in almost every youth program that Split This Rock has had to offer around poetry and spoken word. Um, I was on DCU SLAM team, um, on, and again another year on DCU SLAM team. I'm currently on their Yushindi, a performance troupe. At a time, there was no, there, we had a concept of like, okay, activism, we're in school. We can talk about our problems with our coaches and our sponsors and our librarians and our English teachers, and they're gonna like our words because we're being you know, proactive citizens and stuff. But where does it go after that? You know, the people who are supposed to like what you're saying are gone. 
you know, and I look up now and they have Yushindi. So Yushindi Performance Troupe is a, is a space for um, performers, artists, you know, activists between the ages of, I believe, 18 and 25 who go around, they, they hold, they carry on the traditions, the culture of what we stood for as youth and, and poetry and spoken word, right? So I look up now and I look at all of the, the generations that have gone, you know, come back from, oh my gosh, from like 2009, right? Who were my elders before and they're like on tour now and they're, oh, I have one of my coaches who was nominated for a Grammy and I'm like, oh my gosh, you know, I'm watching all of this happen in front of me and I never left, you know? I've watched their students I've seen who started off shaking. They couldn't even sell, tell you their name when you asked them their name. They break out into a fit of nerves, you know? And I watch them now stand in front and give valedictorian addresses to their classes and I'm so amazingly proud of them. You know, that's change, you know? And it's being present for every part because at some point, you know, that kid wasn't sure of themselves. At one point, that kid was so sure of themselves you know, he thought nothing in the world could break him. The moment before he got on stage, he reverted back, you know? And he was like, what do I do? What do I do? <laughs> you know? And you're like, you got it. You can do it. He's like, okay, this is, this is it. And you're like, wow, you've, you, you've bloomed into a butterfly. You've gone through the whole stage, and here you are. You know, and that's the change. And you, you don't see one kid like that. You see groups of kids. You see, like, whole graduating classes from 16, 17 schools from around the tri-state area who are coming out and stepping into their power, being able to say, ouch, that hurt. Yes, I like that. I don't think that's healthy for the environment, you know? And I'm, that's, that's the change, you know? And it takes being present to witness that process. Yeah, numbers is a tricky game. <laughs> you know, everything is about how many people showed up today to this event. Um, but the conversation we ha we're having right now, excuse me, matters. This conversation will go somewhere. It will be on your live stream. Somebody will see it. Um, you know, I work in the LGBT Equity Center now, and student groups meet weekly. Sometimes it's just the facilitators. <laughs> and sometimes it's five people, sometimes it's 10. But it's the consistency, it's the going, it's the community building. If one person can have a conversation, they can go talk to somebody else. <laughs> right, I, the focus on if, if one person's impacted by immigration, that should matter to all of us. Mm -hmm. If one person is affected by homelessness, that should matter to everyone. It doesn't matter if it's 100 people or one person. Mm -hmm. We should be able to have the resources and use the resources to solve the issues that people are facing, regardless of numbers. Mm -hmm. um, the impact is in the consistency. It's going to take time to see it. The same thing with any kind of presidency. We're not going to know the effects of any presidency until after they're out of office. Mm -hmm. Truly, right? Like that's just a reality. That doesn't mean that there wasn't impact, that there wasn't change. It requires going back. It requires going back to the history. That's where the data should come from. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, so, a common thread that's been coming up throughout the symposium today is the role of technology in each of our spaces. And uh, you know, needless to say, we're pretty weary of it, but also hopeful that it can really advance and move our movements quicker. And in the activist space, it's very important for organizing. And I'm curious what your experiences have been with technology, using it, what are its drawbacks, and uh, is, it, is it our panacea? Can it cure our, <laughs> can it cure our social ills? I don't think so. I question to clarify. Is yeah. it technology as far as social media or technology as a whole? Uh, both. Social okay. media, I feel, is very relevant to activism, especially when you start talking about slacktivism. <laughs> um, I think, so, um, like I said, going back to organizing, we do a lot of that grassroots work, uh, grassroots work. Voter registration, canvassing, going out, doing issue IDs, seeing what the community needs are, like what issues that's really impact them and what kind of changes we need to see in our legislative system. And um, I feel like technology for me as an organizer is a hit or miss sometimes. So you're right, I can reach so many more people using that nice, uh, nice little technology saying, hey, hey guys, hey everyone, this is great. Can you come out to this event or we're doing canvassing. What, what issues concern you? 
at the same time, one of the most, uh, one of the most things that I, I feel that we are now losing is that relationship, the genuine relationships that we're able to create when we have those one-on-one -on -one conversations and we genuinely care about what's coming back in terms of response. And um, as much as I love reaching, to me, I know it makes an impact to uh, reach a lot of people. But at the same time, uh, I feel like it's really important that we also make sure that our conversations stay genuine and that using, when we're using that technology, we have to remember that the purpose of it is to get these people involved. You don't want it to be a one-time thing where they're like, okay, I saw the message and then turn it over. You want it to be a genuine conversation where like, oh, hey, 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 Jen, can you come out? today, you know, I didn't see you last week. And so to know that you're paying attention to their presence and to their activism, I think is really important. So yes, it speeds up the process, but we have to make sure that we use it effectively and, and, and make sure that we don't lose the genuine, genuine relationships that we should be building with our community members. Yeah, I agree with that. I mean, <laughs> technology is hit or miss, social media particularly. One, how many things do I scroll past a day that I'm like, I'm not reading this? Like, I saw the headline, I'm not engaging it. Mm -hmm. That does nothing. I haven't clicked on it. I haven't looked at it. <laughs> you know, um, people can also create worlds where they don't engage other things. Mm -hmm. They can create bubbles. That's also dangerous. <laughs> They're not abreast of the issues in the world. Um, I think a good space, honestly, has been Twitter. <laughs> I will give Twitter that. Facebook, I'm like, I don't, I don't care what you have to say. <laughs> um, everybody's aunties and uncles on it talking crazy. I don't have time. But <laughs> what Twitter allows <laughs> me to do is I'm able to see so many conversations, Twitter town hall meetings. People are able to ask questions. Um, scholars that I've read, I can say, hey, how are you? Or people I've never seen before. I can follow hashtags. I get so much more information that way. Um, so I will say I'll give Twitter that. Um, technology has also connected me to people. As somebody who grew up in an immigrant family, I can't see my family in Jamaica. I can't see my niece, but WhatsApp allows me to talk to her often. Right, so there's connections in that. I can, you know, sometimes it's just telling somebody, hey, I haven't seen you in person, but let me tell you this tweet. How are you today? Or I like your photo or self-confidence. Right, um, we often talk about young people having confidence issues, um, self-esteem issues. Um, the levels of mental illness or depression and things like that. I'm like, sometimes posting a photo is somebody's way of saying, see me. Them getting that like matters. Them getting that comment matters. I don't know. I hear you on the hit or miss. It's a, it's a fine line to walk. <laughs> Definitely. Um, I deal with everybody's social media and everybody's technology every day after school. Um, and it is indeed a hit or miss. Um, it, I don't know if you guys are familiar with like the whole cyberbullying and everything, right? Um, in my poetry groups, you know, in order to prevent that, because in their high school, they have this ongoing thing around everybody's class. Every teacher has the same issue as me, um, where they talk. They have separate conversations. They'll have like multiple group chats in the same room. So if I'm sitting with 10 people, I'll have three of you in one group chat, seven of you in another group chat, me and my best friend in, an, in our own personal, and I'm just like, that is so disrespectful. Like, that is so, like, it doesn't honor the honor system, you know, the honor code, you know, of being able to be accountable for the words that you say, you know, and, and the way people receive them. So if I say something that offends you, you are entitled to feel offended, you know, and you are entitled to tell me, you know, how that hurt you. And it's my job to say, I'm sorry or I don't care, you know, <laughs> and that's how conversations start, you know, and we get around to getting to the root of these issues, and if we never address them, we hide behind all of our group chats, and it's like putting up doors, like if I just put up a curtain right here, and say, this is my, my mic and my conversation. We can't, I can never get anything beyond the other side of the curtain, you know, my side, and your side looks completely different. Um, however, Google has been a really great, um, assistance for a spoken word artist in this whole comp competition process. Um, I don't know if you guys are familiar with the difference between regular poetry and spoken word poetry, right? Spoken word poetry doesn't just live on a page, it lives on the stage. It's live in front of you, right? So their action words, their movements that accompany words, their tonalities that change, right? 
And that's so hard to communicate just across papers. But Google and Google Docs allows, you know, for bolds and italicis and also to like add, have people who aren't present for the meeting, you know, adding in on in their poems, going home, the kids never stop writing. You know, whenever they want to, they can just add something to a poem. And tomorrow they're like, hey, we finished a whole poem. I'm like, wow, when'd you guys find time for that? You know? And I find that um, in sharing it and, and all of that, it's, it's superiorly, what's that word? Really, really effective, you know, um, at, uh, you know, keeping everybody in, involved that way. So I would say, like, uh, for us, my solution for that between Google and the group chats is um, purposeful, you know, use of technology. Like, right now, we are working, you know, so if you need to use your Google, you know, crack out your phone, so be it. I'm watching you. You know, I'll, I'll hold them accountable myself, you know, as, as someone who's responsible for creating a safe space, you know. So if it's work time, be work, don't use this time, talk about the gossip. <laughs> so, oh, yeah. And I will also add, um, I wasn't here for the earlier panels, but think of historically. Um, think about the civil rights movement in Vietnam, right, and the protests against Vietnam. That happened because we were able to see on TV what was happening in the rest of the world. Twitter has allowed that, Facebook has allowed that, Google has allowed that, right? That we are able to connect movements. <laughs> We're able to hold other governments accountable and those governments can hold our government accountable. Mm -hmm. right? We can be in a global human rights movement because of technology. So I just wanted to give that, <laughs> that positive as well. Yeah, so technology, social media in particular, allows us to communicate with each other a little bit more and have access to more people, but it doesn't necessarily mean that we're connecting or learning or actually doing anything for the movement. So beyond <laughs> hashtags, we can go out and actually see each other in person, gather at rallies, and n make a difference through organizations and individually. Um, so I guess that leads me to my, my next big question, which is um, how do we, how do we get involved? Like, what's our next steps? What's, what's most important to start first? Uh, I know we, we talked a little bit in the back room about culture change versus policy change. Um, what are, where do we, do we start by changing policies and then adjusting culture? Do we start by changing the way we think about things and then hoping policy will go along with it? What, where's the most important starting point for people who want to become activists? I keep ending up getting the mic first, but um, I think there's so many ways, there's so many opportunities for us to get involved, but because we see that there are so many different ways for us to get involved, we, we start wasting time, right? Uh, man, I don't know what to do. Do I go to a protest? Do I, do I join? Like, do I become a member of this organization? What do I have to do? But really, you just do it. You just gotta do it. If you see someone that's, that's knocking on doors to get you know, to understand what the issues are, you join them. And if you see that if there's a protest with a purpose, not just any protest, but a protest that shows that there is, there is an issue and there is a concern and that they're really trying to be vocal and make their voices heard, you join that. I think the more time we spend thinking about how do we make change happen, the more time we're losing and the, the farther we get from the movement. And so I really do believe that it's really important that we get involved by just doing whatever is at our at our, you know, at the front of our door, because at the end of the day, it's all connected. And as long as it's it's it stems to the values of what you believe in, and you start making small changes like that, then you know, we, at the end, at some point in our lives, we'll see a change happen. So. I agree, and it's both and. I don't know if you have to do one or the other. It can simultaneously occur. Right, like we're all on this panel doing something different, engaged in different work, but all of our work goes back to the root causes of issues. Right, the issues are racism, gender bias, um, you know, sexuality, all these other things. But the the sorry, I supposed to hold the mic right here. I'm very bad at this. Um, it's both and. It's always both and. Um, start somewhere. Just go and do it. I agree. You know, if that means that you spend your summer interning somewhere, then do that. Maybe you'll find out, eh, I'm not really a fan of interning. I don't want to do policy. I want to be on the ground. Maybe talking to people every day is your thing. Maybe being in the office, maybe tweeting, being behind the scenes technology. You're only going to find that out by trying, mm -hmm. by getting out there. 
you don't have to stay with anything long term per se. Adding to that, um, definitely being the change that you want to see in this world, right? Um, coming out of high school, I'm like, I'm an adult. I can make my own decisions. I have power, right? With that power, I didn't want to just be loose with it and go have fun with my friends and like go party. We had a little party time, but you know, I wanted to I wanted to do something because something so profound had been done in my life, right? I a little personal history about me. Um, I come from a, a background of domestic violence, and for me, getting through high school that was the most traumatic years of my parents' divorce. So I found this piece in poetry. I found this space to address the issues that I had been silent on, that people in my family had been silent on, that I felt needed to be addressed for the safety, for the health of our future and longevity, you know? And I was like, who am I to be selfish and keep that to myself, you know? So I was like, where can I go to continue this work? What can I do to continue this work if it worked in me, you know? Um, and I started reaching out to every nonprofit organization that DC had to offer around um, poetry and activism and change and youth work. Um, and I found Split This Rock. I held on to Split This Rock. I found um, there's a few of them <laughs> that are going on. Um, and I kept going. You know, I started just attending the shows, like just going to the open mics and seeing what the kids were doing, being a good space holder. Like while some kids were on stage getting through hard poems, being that person after to go up in there and be like, I'm so proud of you. I don't know who you are, but it took courage today to go do that. And you, that's something you never let go of. You know? And I don't know why I came there, but maybe that was that one reason I was there for the day. And I felt like I did my part. You know? And going on from that, I'm saying, OK, now if I can support kids who aren't, I don't even know these kids. You know, I can like work with students to believe in themselves before they hit the stage. You know? So let me go figure out how that works. OK, I like how this works. Now, how can I go do that with myself, with adults who have already mastered that process to go make a bigger impact in the world? You know, So it never stops. Every time you decide that you see something wrong and you fixed it yourself, it's almost your obligation you know, to walk someone else through that process. You know, If you don't, no one else will. And if that knowledge gets lost, it's history. You know, cultures, traditions, things get lost in processes if they're never passed down, if they're never taught, if no one ever takes the time for understanding, you know. That reminds me of one of my favorite activist mottos, which is silence is violence. If we're not saying anything, then we're, if you're not saying anything, you're part of the oppressor. Um, so very interesting, and I'm, I'm curious practically, in your organizations, in, in your activist work now, or in your academic work, What's next? Uh, are, there, are there upcoming events? What, what are you guys, what's the next step here? So, poetry people, I don't know. Um, Split This Rock is so cool. Oh my god, I really love them. Um, they have a poetry festival that I believe is still happening. Um, it's for the old, the, old, the old cats, you know, the people who know and have been around in like artistic, you know guys want sophisticated environment. Um, you can go on splitthisrock.org to find out all about that information. Um, the one I'm more versed in is their cool uh, Louder Than a Bomb competition, the Tri-State Area DMV, is happening this Saturday at Woodrow Wilson Senior High School. Um, come out and see them do their like prelim stuff. Their finals is happening May 5th, I believe, at the Millennium Stage at the Kennedy Center. And you guys can definitely come out. But splitthisrock.org, you can find all of the cool things to be involved in. Um, Academically, I don't know what I'm doing with my life. <laughs> I'm at the end of my journey, so I'm trying to figure that out. But I will plug Undocu Black. Um, Undocu Black is a great organization, doing great work. Follow them on Twitter, follow them on Instagram. They have a website, Google them. Um, read. <laughs> I know I keep saying this, but honestly, educate yourself. <laughs> Misinformation is out there so much. <laughs> And everybody thinks they're doing it. They're like, oh, yeah, I'm being intersectional. What does that actually mean when you hear these words, these catchphrases? Look those up. So that's my plug. Um, for me, I think, um, so with NACASEC, we do a lot of crazy things. We did like a campaign out in front of the White House, 22 days, 24 hours. Yeah, we were, we're like those crazy people. And we're starting a new campaign called um, Citizenship for All. 
So we're like, if you're not going to give us a little dream act, then we're going to ask for the entire pie. So um, we launched a campaign. It's a 45-day campaign starting August 15th. And we're going to bike for about 2,600 miles and go to all the strategically congress strategic congressional districts and try to listen to the voters. And um, of course, there's there's that. There's like that big leap in our national level. But I also wanted to ask who here is from Virginia? Anybody? Any hi. <laughs> one one lone soldier. <laughs> you and I both. Um, so uh, there is a lot of local things happening. Either that be local ordinances. Um, for us, it's midterm elections. Everyone, everywhere, you all have a state. I'm sure at some, you guys go home somewhere. So um, there will be midterm elections. Go canvas. Go help do phone banking. Go s make sure that you have the right person in power and that you elect the person that you want to represent you. And so and that is next. And the last thing I would say is listen and be more aware, is to listen, not not just think about your own issues, but listen to what your neighbors are dealing with. Listen to the, the problems that are going on in your society. Just be more aware and educate yourself. Um, and that's it for me. <laughs> Wonderful. I also want to put the audience on blast. Um, so if you look to the center of your tables, there's a card there that says, now what? On the back, uh, you can find links to a lot of our panelist organizations, as well as a few other resources. Um, but I recognize that there are a lot of amazing people here. And I kind of want to flip the, flip the dialogue and put it on y'all to um, say, what's next with your organization? So if we can get a mic passed around, um, raise your hand, say your name, your organization, and if you have any upcoming events or activist priorities that you think people should read about or focus on or just anything that, can, that someone can do next, um, now is the time to, to announce that to the room. Anyone? No brave souls. Okay, um, well, hold on to that, definitely. It's something that I'll run around asking people at the reception because it's important that this work doesn't stop. Uh, whatever you care about, whatever that issue area is, gun control, immigration, it's important to tell other people and to keep up the, the good work. So um, yeah, let's, with that, move on to our question and answer with the wider audience. And while people are thinking about questions that they want to ask our panelists, um, I will go ahead and start us off with one of mine. So this is one that I think about quite often. And it's, how do you maintain momentum, uh, especially in the current political landscape, uh, the way that people have been talking about making change federally versus you know, the pause there. How do you stop from getting tired and, and wake up the next day and go, yeah, this is something that still matters that I still care about and go out there and put your all into it? What motivates you? Community. Um, I have the greatest friends. Um, so just a little bit. Um, a couple of years ago, I lost my mom. I was still in graduate school, I'm still trying to finish. And honestly, it was the folks in my friendship circle who was like, one, go to counseling. You need it. You need friends to be honest with you. Get those folks in your life. Um, I also live in a house with people, so that helps me in terms of motivating me every day to get up. I have people to talk to every day. I also work on a campus with undergraduate students. So I, I put myself in spaces where I see people constantly. Um, and seeing them going keeps me going. Um, and then in terms of just, I watch Netflix, sometimes I'll just chill out. I, I don't talk to anyone, I stay by myself. <laughs> I rejuvenate, I regroup, <laughs> I think about it. And I always keep at the forefront of my mind is, what's my biggest goal here? What is, ultimately, what is it that I want to do? And that is to, in fact, change. In order to do that, I have to get up every day. How do we keep momentum, mm -hmm. right? Um, so for me, in, in what I do as a youth facilitator, as a teaching artist, um, I deal with these kids in their most rawest forms. You know, they come to me when they're like the most 
you know, gassed up to do poetry, or they're like the most angry and they want to put their anger into words, or they are a bucket of tears and they're just falling apart. Right? And I have to remind myself every day not to internalize you know, their issues as my own, but remind myself that I care and I see them. And, and to an ex extent, in some of their stories, I can empathize with them on a personal level. You know? And for some of them, I can look at them and be like, I would not wish that on you, you know, but we're going to deal with it. And that's the thing that keeps me going every day. Like, we have to deal with it. Like, we can cry in a day. But tomorrow we gotta wake up and do something about it, you know. And I, that's that's what I constantly hold on to. Um, I always think, and I laugh with my my coaches who who are now my like peers in this whole teaching thing. And I tell them like I now understand like what you meant like leaving us and being like I'm gonna go have a glass of wine. Don't call me till 2 p.m. tomorrow, you know. <laughs> I understand that, you know, because. In this process, you have to take yourself out of it because if you don't, you come with all of the, the aggression from everybody's argument, including your own. So I'm upset that someone hurt my kid, and now I'm upset with anyone who looks like they're going to hurt anyone else to the extent that someone hurt my kid, you know? And I'm like, er, now I'm upset that you would even try me and dis, you know? So that all that stuff has to be decompressed. You have to say, we made it through today, you know? Now we have to make it through tomorrow. And we have to have ourselves in pristine shape to make it through tomorrow, you know? Um, so yeah, it's, about, it's definitely about self-preservation in the process. Well, I'm just gonna, I ditto everything. Um, but really, I just kind of look in the mirror. I'm like, man, my reality sucks. Like, I gotta change it. Man, I have all this debt. Like, this is awful. Look at my friend, her reality sucks. Then I look at, Look at my parents, I'm like, oh man, that sucks too. I'm like, well, it's not gonna get any better if I sit here and do nothing. It's not gonna get any better if I go and find, if I look at a job, I'm like, I'm going there because of how much it's gonna pay me. Because will, it, will my life get better? Will my dads, will my, will my friends? And I don't, think, I don't think it will. So that's why, that's what keeps me going every day so that I can get out of this, this hole that I'm in and get other folks out of that hole too. I have an announcement and a question. So I'll start with the announcement. Uh, my name is Sakina. I work for DC Hunger Solutions. And if you are a district resident, um, the council is in the middle of their budget cycle right now. Um, primaries are coming up. And on May 15th, my organization, um, as part of the Fair Food for All Coalition, is hosting a candidates forum to talk about issues related to food insecurity, health equity, food access, urban agriculture, and economic development um, for people running for council positions and specifically um, the chair position, uh, Phil Mendelson and Ed Lazier. And so if anyone is interested in that and you're a DC resident or just wanna be involved, I'd be happy to you know, loop you into that. Um, I have a question about language, specifically um, from an academic, from an activist, from a, a poet, and where all those things mix together. Um, I think that a lot of times the term people of color can sort of flatten experiences. Um, and so my question is, when do we as, as writers, as artists, as managers, as people who um, are concerned with the experiences uh, more largely of poor people, when do we get explicit in our language? When do we say black? When do we say native? When do we say Latinx or even more specifically Mexican, Salvadorian, Korean? You know, when do we get explicit in our language versus um, using the catch-all phrase people of color, which I think has a lot of power in it, but I think doesn't always honor um, or recognize the, ex the explicit experiences of people that are struggling. And so may, I'm asking maybe how does that show up in your work and maybe in your, in your analysis and in, in your activism and your poetry, when do we get explicit and when do we sort of group? Um, in poetry, um, it's a very fine, fine place we walk, right? Um, it's figurative language, right? These are words that were chosen on purpose, right? So. Um, I'd like to believe sometimes when people use the term people of color, they lack knowledge, you know, and that's all that they have. And that's something that can, that gives people representation enough, you know, and it's unfortunate that that's enough, 
but that's that it gives in our society it, it logs you know exactly who you're talking about when people add color you know to that part um, what I'm learning now and what's really cool about what my students did with the diversity task force is to be um, impeccable to be accountable for your words speak in truth and speak in purpose you know, so if I, if I, when I say Caucasian or I say white, I'm not saying that in a derogatory way. You know, if I say black, if I say African American or Negro, I'm not saying that in a derogatory manner. You know, um, I'm, I'm saying that in the context in which it applies. You know, so when you take your, out your little form, you check off that, you know, race, what race are you box, I'm using the terminology that you would check off, you know, as far as I'm concerned, you know, or for as far as you, whatever knowledge you've given me. Um, which is really, it can be scary in certain environments, right? So when we had our conversation around the Colored Museum, we asked the students to use the terms in which they meant, you know, not the ones in which sounded good and not the ones that were derogatory, you know, to anybody present in the conversation. Because if you can imagine a very segregated conversation, you know, a, a white cast who didn't understand what the issue was with wanting to give this play to the community because they're like, you know, our, our mixed demographic does not show in our department. And so let's do this so we have presence, right? Context is everything, you know? And, and when you say black, are you saying black with an amount of, you know, normalcy? Are you saying it like, okay, you are black, you are African American, right? That's what you are. Or am I saying black like it disgusts me? You know, am I saying black like it's an issue? Am I saying black like it scares me? You know, that's when it becomes scary. When you apply all of the, the stereotypes that come along with each race, you know, the tones, the connotation, the context behind the word is the scariest part of it all. And that's all can be guided by your personal intention. You as individuals, as people who can speak, who have a vocal cord and like a pair of lips, you know, and a mind that controls it, you choose what words come out of your mouth with what tonality backs those words, you know, and what positions at what time in which you say them and you use them, you know. Um, and as poets, that's what you find. My students are not allowed to use vulgar language. No curse words, no slurs, no name calling, no nothing, right? So they have to be very mindful about what they say. So I have a student who um, has done a poem about like antagonists in history, right? And I'm saying when you're speaking on the Spaniards and the conquistadors and everybody else, you know, make sure if you're using names, you're, you're using names and you're saying them in the way you mean it. You know, you're using them in the context in which is relevant. You know, you're not just saying it just for shock value, you know. And I think a lot of times in our society, people say things just for shock value, you know, literally just to agitate someone into conflict, you know. And I think we have to as a society decide that chaos is not the best form of entertainment, you know? And I think we haven't decided that. So in the process, we love the stereotypes of it all. And I feel, we feel like we entertain that more than taking the time to get down to the truth, you know, behind those terms. Um, I, I actually wanna, um, I'm one of those people that is in this process of learning. So in, in college, I, in high school, I thought, uh, defining the black community as black community was wrong. Because they would say, oh, Sumi, you can't say black. I'm like, okay, then what do I say? And they were like, you use African American. I'm like, okay. And I started using that, and in college, they were like, Sumi, not everyone is from Africa. You can't say that. And I'm like, then what do I say? I, I learned that I can't say black, and now I, I can't, you can't judge where, where the person's from by just looking at them. So what do you want me to do? And, you know, over time, I, I was like, I think it just, you have to see if they feel comfortable. And then I came here at Nakasek and then started working with undocumented people. So when I hear people say illegal, I, get, I, I cringe. I'm like, oh man, don't say illegal, that's not right. But I had, um, and we always call folks undocumented, right? But um, we had, we had a, a, an Im, uh, impacted person um, who was documented say, I'm gonna own the word illegal, and I'm gonna call myself an illegal immigrant, and I'm gonna own that word. But um, at the same time, you have to understand, you can't own that word by yourself. You do not represent every single person in that community. 
for the word queer community and the LGBTQ community, that was adopted because that although at some point the word queer was a derogatory term to phrase those folks that were in the LGBTQ community, over time they took, you know, the community took ownership of it. But that was only because lots of people in the community accepted that and said we can take ownership. But one person saying I can own the word illegal and, and be a legal immigrant, that wasn't something that came by the voices of everyone. So I think we are walking on fine lines. We are trying to understand what words, what words fit and how we know at the same time, I don't know the entire history, I don't know when. So I think it really, you can just ask. You can just ask, be like, what's the best? And at the same time, you're, you're learning. But if you ask and you don't apply it, then there's a problem. So I think it, with language, it's really of picking up if who's comfortable and where, what setting you're at and making sure that you learn from that experience. Uh, yes, I personally use black over people of color, um, but that's context-based. Um, if I was talking about a group of people <laughs> who are diverse, I would say people of color. In my own personal research, I am talking about black immigrants, and I use black broadly speaking, right? So that encompasses Caribbean, African, um, Afro-Latinx, all of that. But then even when I get deeper into my work, I'm like, okay, I'm talking about Jamaicans here. I'm talking about Ghanaians here. Um, so it's about intentionality, about being as explicit as possible. And also just because I call myself something does not mean that you get to call me something. And you should ask. <laughs> right? um, I get to identify myself the way that I want to. I use black because my family is Caribbean, but I also want to encompass that I grew up in an African American setting as well. But I don't always use African American. <laughs> so it's, it's about intentionality. What are we trying to get across? be explicit because their experience is tied to specific populations, to specific histories. So it's not just people of color are affected. No, Latinx, non-black Latinx are affected in a particular way. Mexicans are affected in a particular way. The narrative created around, that, about, around Mexican people as being undocumented or illegal has a particular representation, right? Um, blackness or um, some other term has particular representation to it. <laughs> So what are we saying about those experiences and how are we talking about them? Be explicit, be intentional. Wonderful. Uh, I'll, I'll take another question. Uh, yes. One theme I've noticed fairly across the board from one of the first things we talked about was that young people have different, you know, more diverse than any other generation, different views, the fact that we're having this conversation now, you know, 60 years ago, absolutely not. Um, I'm wondering what the, you know, based on the industry that I'm working in, I work for the Democrat Governor Association, and kind of some of the things I've seen, um, only third week on the job, but um, you know, at least uh, for elected officials, you know, whether it's state, local, federal, um, it depends on ear time for them, you know, who they're talking to, um, to be informed, uh, regardless of you know, um, who they are. It's about you know, who's their advisors and who they're talking to from outside interests. And something I've seen is that you know, if it's government relations professionals at all levels, not a lot of diversity there. And uh, some things I've been thinking about is at least of, you know, a two-pronged approach. One, and maybe it's both, and this is what I want to ask about, um, is it you know, trying to make sure that there's a pipeline for um, you know, people of color and you know, for regards of education level as well. It's not just um, you know, race or ethnicity. It's across the board, income, um, education. How can we um, you know, get a pipeline going so that you know, when there's these conferences with um, government relations professionals, it's not just uh, Caucasian people there at the same time, you know, do you have any suggestions on uh, organizations that are effectively lobbying, you know, going to D.C.? For example, I'm from Los Angeles, and there are definitely more advocacy organizations uh, going to D.C. in the Bel Air area as opposed to the South Central area, and I think that's important for elected officials to have both perspectives, but from people I know working on the Hill, they're getting much more of that Bel Air uh, lobbying experience, or lobbying than the South Central lobbying, which I think is um, not as, uh, not what we need right now in terms of diversity. So I just wanted to see if you had any thoughts on uh, that overall and what we can do to promote uh, diversity in lobbying. Um, I think one thing that's important is that we get out of our comfort zone. So for me, I, if there's all these tables and I see an Asian person, I go to the Asian person because it's, I feel more comfortable. Um, and when I was at an 
organizing training. We had a lot of organizers, very diverse, and we always said, but we don't want to work, like we can't work with white people, we can't. It just, it's, because there's, we talk about colonialism and how there's a lot of that, that oppression that's coming and how privileged white people are and that it's not, it's not, it's not fair, you know? And then I'm thinking, it's, I'm like, you know, we have to all work together. We gotta all bring, we gotta, we gotta work together and get out of this idea that we can't, we have to stick within our community and that our community is the only one being oppressed. We have to work with every single uh, kinds of, uh, of, of folks that are being oppressed like we are. And so in terms of how do we get folks that are more diverse into these kind of conferences and, and doing that, it's we go into communities that we've never been in before. We go and make sure that we go introduce ourselves to organizations and say, hey, let's collaborate with youth. Let's let's do something together. And and once that relationship builds up and, and we do that, then we can see that these conferences become more diversified and there is not there's no more barriers that say we're different. Because at the end of the day, we're not, because we're fighting for the same cause. So I think there really is a need to just get out of the comfort zone, go do something, sit at a table that you've never met before, uh, with people you've never met before, that, with people that don't look like you, try something different. And, and I think that's the only way we can, we can get that started. Um, no one wants to be a token. So a lot of times the model for diversity in a lot of orgs is, just getting a person of color. Doesn't matter the person of color. Right? So if they identify as Asian or black or whatever, oh yeah, we have a person of color. They're gonna to talk to other people of color. How many orgs are you connecting with? <laughs> Not just this one black org is your one black org, but how about five other orgs in DC? <laughs> just connecting. Like, I don't go to a lot of places that are predominantly white because I don't want to be the only person there. That's a black person. <laughs> I spend a lot of time on campus at Maryland. I'm like, what is the goal here in diversity? Is it just about having one person and we can just say, oh, okay. We checked off our box for black. We checked off our box for Latina. We checked off our box for, Lat um, for Asian Americans, whomever. So my suggestion would be to your organization is, who's on your listserv? What orgs are on your listserv? What orgs have showed up? Who do they know? Send it to five people or five different black orgs or five different Asian, send it to Nakasak, and if you ask Nakasak, hey, who do you all work with? Black. <laughs> <laughs> right, and Anaki Black, who are you working with? Maybe they're working with Baji, I don't know. Right, but also the burden shouldn't be on just asking people of color either. Like, what models are already in place and what's, what's happening with those models? To speak on like the you're going through like the real process of what the high school is going through right now and trying to figure out how do we diversify their music department, right? Um, what I've seen them do, which I, I feel like is so profound in what they've done, um, is stopping everything. You know, they stop pressing for the deadline. They stop reaching for, like, they are upset that they spent money on the script already and money on the costumes. They're like, forget the money. You know, the people's feelings mean a lot more than this money and the time that we say is like documented, like we have to like monitor every minute of it, right? Um, and they said, let's figure out how our high school came to have such a racially tense environment in the first place, you know? And they sit with the librarian who's on the board of the Alumni Association and she's getting to understand like, what is the history of black and white presence at Wilson High School, right? And they're learning that Wilson was one of, the, one of the last high school, first high schools to integrate. And at the start of that integration, a lot of the white families said, that's disgusting, we're leaving the city. They moved, they, they bought other houses in other parts of this area. So there was like a small moment of time in the 60s where Woodrow Wilson High School was predominantly black. But the circumstances, you have to understand the context and the history behind that to know why it was predominantly black. You know, It wasn't given to black people like, here, take all these great resources and, and finally better your education. It was given to them by default. You know? And they had to sit there for that year when those kids came back and you know, they realized they couldn't stay at those private schools and those public schools that, okay, now we have to have this conversation because my parents have been telling me one thing about you and my parents have been telling me something about you. So let me know what your parents have been telling, me about, telling you about me. Okay, and I'll tell you what my parents have been telling me about you. 
Now we'll pick out the truths and stuff together. So I'll say that even if you have two people going in different directions to get different kinds of, of um, knowledge, so if someone's in Oakland and someone's you know wherever else, they come back together, you know, and you say like, what did the people in Oakland have to say about the people over here? And what did the people over here have to say about the people in Oakland? And then you start to pick together, like what are just the opinions, you know, of the people? What is the bias of the people? You know, and where is that rooted? And what is just truth? You know, what is that one thing that ties them all together? Yeah, and I'm actually, I'm gonna speak to this question as well really quickly. Um, one is, we need to get rid of the idea that naming race is partisan. Um, right now, a lot of uh, people hear black, brown, Hispanic, um, and immediately, if they're Republican, close their eyes, stop listening. We need to get rid of that idea because race is something that applies to all people. Uh, well, not. <laughs> race is something that matters. Um, and. Uh, two, you know, there are black, Hispanic, Asian people here in D.C. already. We need to hire them, and we need to respect their voices and listen to them. And we need to do that by addressing systemic barriers. Um, people who are low income can't take the day off work to come lobby on the Hill. People who, um, have, who live in the suburbs because that's where they were redlined to 50 years ago, uh, have problems with transportation. We need to address that. So there are so many systemic policy things that we can do to increase diversity beyond just our individual actions and the way we treat people. Um, so I encourage you all to, to read <laughs> and to look into those issues as well. So uh, we're running out of time. I'd like to take one really, really quick question and maybe a rapid fire answer if there is any. No. Okay. Well, we'll be we'll be here after. Come bring your questions directly to us. Thank you. Thank you to the panelists for being here. Um, and thank you all. This is our last panel, so I'd like to introduce uh, Reed Kramer. Well, I just want to thank uh, the panel. Was great. Really compelling. Thank you for being here. We're closing the symposium now, and we would love to, for you to join us upstairs on the tenth floor. I think there's a nice deck. We'll be able to get outside today for a reception, so please join us up there and thank you for your time and attention today. Yeah, thank you. Thank you.